Welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome to this unofficial first program of Celebrating Descent. Uh, I'm very happy that you are all here uh, at 4 o'clock. That's very special on a Friday. Um, my name is Sophie Rutefrans. I am a program editor here in the Bali, and uh, together with Mariam uh, and some other colleagues, we organize this festival. Um, this is the very first, uh, first program, uh, and we will do this till Sunday evening, so it's going to be a long ride. Um, in the coming hours, my colleagues will interview um, uh, Tasrima Nazrin, uh, Saif Umaluk, und, uh, and also Ina Shevchenko. Uh, but I will start with, uh, with Mariam Namazi. Welcome. So great that you're here. Um, you are Iranian-born writer and activist. Uh, you are the spokesperson for FITNA, um, the movement for women's liberation, One Law for All, and the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. And you also host a weekly television program in Persian and in English called Bread and Roses. And you do so much more things, but I thought these were the most important. Um, so we have an hour together uh, to talk about your life, your work, and everything that's, that evolves around that. Um, so I wanted to start at the beginning, uh, because your parents fled Iran uh, in 1980, if I'm correct. Um, why did they fled the country? Mm -hmm. uh, so before we start, Hello, everyone. I, I, I apologize <laughs> for boring you to death for an hour. <laughs> but thank you for uh, making me feel like I'm special. Uh, and of course, thank you to the amazing Dabali for giving us this opportunity. Uh, it's really, really something wonderful. Um, and uh, uh, well, about your question, I mean, um, uh, we were in Iran until 1980, yeah. and then it was a year after the um, Iran. Well, the Iranian Revolution was from 1978 to 79, and of course, it wasn't an Islamic revolution. It was a revolution against the Shah's dictatorship. My dad loved the Shah, so he doesn't like me calling it a dictatorship, but it was, and uh, it was not uh, for an Islamic state by any means. And we know that's the case in many other countries too. You know, like in Tunisia and other other places. Many we've got many examples of the Arab Spring in Syria, for example. We see. Um, how this movement has expropriated people's desires and demands. So in the beginning, you thought it might be something good. It Definitely, the revolution it was came. something very good. Yeah. And uh, but but it, when when they actually took power, and then there were executions on TV. They were trying to enforce veiling. Uh, you know, uh, it became a very scary place very quickly. And so uh, actually, uh, my mother came to take me to India because. Even though I'm Iranian, I was born in Iran, my mother is from Nepal, it's interesting, and my yeah. father is Iranian, but he was born in Calcutta. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. <laughs> and my mom and my dad met each other at a party in Calcutta, and my dad was going to come back to live in Iran uh, in two weeks, and she followed him. I mean, that's how crazy <laughs> women were <laughs> in those days, day and ages. So um, my mom had actually, uh, just come to take me to India to put me in school because the schools had closed down. Wow. I was about 13 at the time, uh, 12, 13, and uh, they wanted me to carry on my education and she was planning on going back. So she had actually left my three-year-old sister in Iran with my dad. Wow. And, uh, and wha what do you remember of that time when you went to India? Was this what it, was this a strange moment for you, or? Um, it, well, you know, it, it was it was not some it was not supposed to be final. Uh, no. So that's what's heartbreaking for me because I never thought I would never go back. Oh God, I'm just I've already <laughs> I, I get emotional. It's only taking me five minutes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so I never expected not to ever go back. No. Uh, so I didn't really uh, say bye to my friends, my grandmother. I thought she's going to drop me in school, like uh, people who go to school abroad. You know, they'll come back. Yeah, I'll come back after holidays afterwards. Things settle down. Yeah. But my dad told uh, my mom not to return. So we actually were in a boarding um, house for many months until uh, my father uh, finally managed to come with my little sister. Uh, and then we never went back. So it, you know, so it was very difficult at the same time. Yeah. And then we weren't allowed to stay in India. We, weren't, we came to Britain for a year. 
they didn't let us stay. Uh, so then we went to the United States because my uncles were there and they said, you know, come and you might be able to stay here. And they actually took our passports away at the American border because they said, we know you're coming here to stay. And we're like, no, 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 we're just here for a holiday. <laughs> uh, so yeah, bring wow. more. that's what a lot yeah. of people do and they have no choice to. So, and then we just managed to stay in the US. Yeah, wow, that's, a, that's an impressive story. Um, and when you came to the United States, so y your uncles were already already there, and was there like a big Iranian community or other people mm. that have fled there? Um? Yeah, I mean, lots of people have fled Iran, and they continue yeah. to flee Iran because after 40 years, there's still so much repression there. Uh, so there's constantly waves of uh, refugees and asylum seekers. So my uncles were there, and in fact, both of them returned to Iran. One died there, and another one has been sentenced to 10 years in prison there. Uh, and uh, he's 80 years old. So, um, you know, there was this back and forth of people trying to go back yeah. and make it work, and uh, the persecution continued. Uh, so in the U.S., uh, I was 17 when I went there, um, and I went to university straight after and uh, just settled there, worked at McDonald's and <laughs> all the stuff immigrants do. Yeah. Uh, you know, my father was a journalist and he worked in the central bank. He became a career service man, uh, a, a, a security guard, anything, anything to make ends yeah. meet, which is the story of all immigrants, isn't it? And, and yeah. in a way, you feel sorry for the older generation because they give up everything uh, for us, and then we go ahead and become blasphemers and apostates. <laughs> <laughs> and really mess things <laughs> up, you know? <laughs> yeah, ab Sorry. about that. Um, <laughs> great that you mentioned it. Um, because w were your parents religious and or mm. not really religious? or? Well, I it's funny because uh, my father is very, uh, was brought up very religious, so he's never had a drink in his life, and, and I've had quite a few. Uh, he's never eaten pork. Um, and he was brought up, my, my grandfather was a uh, mullah, mm -hmm. a, a religious uh, um, cleric. And of course, because there's such a hatred of religious clerics now in Iran, my parents are like, do not say he was a mullah, he was an Islamic scholar, <laughs> as if that's any better, you know. So um, uh, he grew up in a very strict sort of upbringing. He had to pray five times a day. But my grandfather was actually quite an interesting man. and. Uh, the more I know about him, I kind of like him more because he uh, he was he never put veils on my uh, my aunts. He never veiled his wife, even though my grandma sometimes did wear the veil or the chador sometimes. Um, and he was uh, someone who gave uh, multi prayer. Uh, he was involved in uh, you know giving prayers for all uh, people, not just for Muslims. You know he was very wow. involved in that sort of interfaith Inclusion. sort of thing, yeah. yeah. Which I think is quite uh, a nice thing yeah. to do. You know, quite I don't special. believe in interfaith stuff, but I think <laughs> it's quite nice if you are a person of faith to at least include other people and not just, you know, uh, worry about your own faith. Uh, so, um, yeah, and my grandfather, actually, I saw a picture of him and he looks really scary. He looks like the Taliban. <laughs> Uh, but like even scarier, <laughs> it, because so, <laughs> so it's like we just pretend he doesn't. You know, we're not related to him. That's <laughs> what we do. Our <laughs> um, okay, so so uh, your parents were not were brought up religious, but not in a really strict manner. Yeah, but um, and interesting, my mom was actually a Protestant. Oh wow, because she's Nepalese, uh, where the British have been. You know, they've been colonizing everywhere, planting their seeds everywhere. So. Um, She's part Scottish and part Nepalese, her, so she's you know Nepalese through and through. But her last name is MacDonald. Wow! And yeah, it's just bizarre, <laughs> isn't it? The world is really small. That's why when people are anti-immigrant, it's like, have you done a DNA test? <laughs> so you're going to be surprised, you know. Though the white fascists, you're going to be really surprised. Uh, so uh, she actually converted to Islam to become uh, to marry my dad. And uh, so she's Muslim in name. Yeah. And I think my dad is Muslim. Of course, he orders the Muslim meals on the planes, you know. Uh, it's really good. It's Indian curries. So oh. it's like Sounds it's nice. great food. Yeah. And um, he, um, he doesn't pray anymore, but he's, he, you know, he considers himself a religious man. Yeah. So but nothing, n it's, it was never imposed on me. And that's why I never really hated religion until yeah. an Islamic uh, government took power. Yeah. And then you sort of realize how awful religion can be. 
not as a personal faith, because you know there are lots of good religious people, including in my family, but as as uh, you know, a sort of like an industry, as a. Is uh, it also the interference with the state that makes it complicated? Definitely. I mean, definitely. The more power it has, the more you feel it. You know, especially women, I think, feel it the first, because we're sort of the most visible sign of their control, uh, veiling you. Uh, silencing you, I excluding you, segregating you. It's, it shows how much power they have. So they're very, you know, very focused on, they're obsessed with women, basically. And of course, it has the knock-on effect on free thinkers and, and um, uh, religious and sexual minorities. And yeah. And was that also um, because you fled Iran and you were still sort of a child? Uh, but when did you start to think of yourself as an ex-believer or mm -hmm. a non-believer or was that later? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I don't remember, you know, some people have this day where they're like, that's the day yeah. I became a, a no, you know, non-believer. I don't really have that. And I really wish I did because I'd have a good story to tell <laughs> you, but I don't. Uh, so for me, it was very gradual, uh, you know, uh, living, uh, leaving Iran. Uh, for me, the refugee thing was very big. I did a yeah. lot of refugee rights work for many years because I felt really, um, hurt by the whole thing and uh, again i'm sorry <laughs> and just uh, it's, it's it's a very fine. emotional thing for me yeah, because it is so painful to leave yeah. everything and lose everything and then yeah. to be treated uh, badly as well when you do leave and uh, just the the effects the psychological effects on everyone and you know you don't like you don't see your family ever again i never saw my grandmother again she died i never could go to her funeral uh, an uncle has died just uh, two weeks ago, we, uh, no, seven days ago, and we couldn't go to his funeral. Um, you know, my my husband's father died. It's just constant. You you, you have this thing yeah. where you can't see people anymore, uh, and yeah. they're also under pressure for what you say and do. Yeah, so being so a refugee has inspired you to do uh, a lot of work at NGOs and uh, yeah. working also with refugees and... You also worked in Sudan, right? Um, yeah. And yeah. you were the director of the International Federation of Iranian Refugees. Yeah. And um, so that's really inspired by your own story and yeah, helping definitely. other people. So that's, so that's why the, you know, my yeah. focus was on refugees. But then if you actually do refugee rights work, you start asking more in-depth questions of why all these people are fleeing. Why are the majority of refugees coming from areas where really it is uninhabitable, you know? And a lot of them are Islamic states. You know, that's the reality of it. And uh, there's a reason why women don't want to live in an Islamic state, why gay people don't want to live in it, why apostates and blasphemers don't want to live in an Islamic state, why young people don't want to, because everything is controlled and restricted, you know? Yeah. So it makes you question more. And I think uh, it, it led me to that, my experience leaving Iran and also working with refugees. Yeah, and working, and was it also the time when you started to become an activist, or um, did that come later? Because was it because of the work that you saw and that you did that you wanted to go on protests and? Uh, yeah, take I mean, action? I think yeah, I think I've always been an activist uh, since I. You're um, born that way. <laughs> since I remember, I mean, since having left, since I was old enough. Yeah. Uh, because it it is very much uh, just part of your life. And uh, it is so, um, so sad and so tragic, really, that I think if you don't become an activist, you will lose your mind, you know, and it's like this need to respond somehow. And of course, we're not like the Islamists or the religious right where they're willing to kill for what they believe in. The only means we have is just, you know, peaceful saying, using our bodies, using our minds, using uh, our speech to try to change things, to try to show that we're dis discontent, that we dissent from the status quo. And so I think it's just very part of you know, being alive and being human, I think. Yeah. It, and it does give you hope, I think, when you dissent. You don't feel as desperate. And it, it helps you survive, I think, uh, all the to traumas do something. we yeah. go through. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned um, uh, the Islamism and the far right uh, together just now, mm -hmm. um, because you also wrote a lot about the similarities between the two. Can you can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Islamism is a far right movement, and that's why I find it quite um, absurd when you have progressive people, and I'm someone on the left myself, but who um, side with the Islamists 
and but are opposed to the white nationalists, for example. They don't see how actually they're part of the same movement. Um, you know, both of them uh, look towards some sort of uh, glor glorious olden age, you know, where things were great. The Islamists do it with the Ummah, for example, the Khalife and the far right. They're dreaming of a time when Europe was white, you know, and Christian. And it was never really that way. That way, you know, it's based on some sort of myth. Yeah. Uh, and it's also based on hating the other. It's based so deeply on misogyny, on homophobia, anti-Semitism. They have so much in common and their use of violence. I mean, I know people will say you can't compare the two because the far right haven't killed as many people as the Islamists have. Well, in the US they have. You know, in the US the white nationalists have killed a lot more people than the Islamists have. And give them the same amount of power and, and they will do the same, you know. So I think um, if we are against, you're against fascism, you need to be against all forms of fascism, not just uh, the white nationalists. And I think it's important for us to show how they are similar so that good people, really good people who are concerned about racism, understand that fighting against Islamism uh, and siding with us, dissenters, is a fight against the far right in general. And do you also see the religious part at the far right? Is that also a component that's important, mm. or is that more a sort of something a factor that comes with it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think religion is key. In uh, uh, you, you have the far, you know, the white nationalists very much relying on Christianity, on symbols of the cross. Even the Ku Klux Klan, for example, they're the knights of you know the Christian knights. Basically, there is that use of Christianity as a way of promoting their agenda, and we see that with the Islamists as well. Yeah. So I think definitely they use religion, um, and but but reli and religion is not, of course. Um, uh, victimless here. It, it's, it's a very useful tool, isn't it, to control people, to control women in particular, to, to squash any form of doubt and dissent. And I think that's why the sort of the celebration of dissent this weekend is so important because, you know, we don't celebrate it at all. We vilify dissent. We look down upon it. You know, those of us who are dissenters are called every name in the book. You know, we're considered troublemakers. We're considered people who are um, uh, everything from being native informants to being uh, bigoted. And in fact, all we're doing is challenging the status quo, as dissenters have done uh, over the centuries. And we're saying that it, you know, it, it's not right to treat people in this way, whatever excuse you have for it, whether it's religion, um, whether it's um, culture, uh, and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, and how would you describe uh, the meaning of dissent? Because that's something that's interesting, because the festival is called Celebrating Dissent. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a lot of Dutch people, it may sound uh, uh, a little strange because mm. um, we don't have, we don't, uh, I don't know. You don't use that term? No. Okay. They're to play. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think actually uh, uh, the Dutch people as well and people everywhere have uh, benefited from dissent, you know, whether it's... Um, uh, the women's suffragist movement, whether it's, you know, uh, for um, shorter working hours and whether it's for um, an end to child labor and, and uh, also a lot of uh, pushing back of the church's role in people's lives, yeah? Um, it, it, it has, the, it's dissent that has helped to pave the way because those in power uh, will never give away uh, their power freely and it's it's battles have been fought for these things and in a sense uh, that a lot of that battle in Europe has been against Christianity uh, the whole enlightenment against Christianity it's not that Christianity is nicer than Islam that's what some people think it's because Christianity has been pushed into a corner and when anything is pushed in a corner it always seems a little nicer than it actually is then it starts handing out food and soup kitchens and <laughs> you know feeding the homeless while you know it tries to get you into the church so it seems a bit nicer and and less less harmful yeah but wherever it has power we're seeing it now the rise of the christian right in the u.s for example the loss of abortion rights things that women thought 
we're won and finished. We're secure, you know? yeah. That's it. We don't need to worry about that anymore. We're seeing those, the, the minute they have power, we're seeing that happen again. In places like Africa, the role of the church, you know, uh, is hugely uh, violent, barbaric, detrimental, you know, in, in the same way that we see with Islam is. <laughs> So I think dissent is something that it's looked down upon nowadays, you know, especially dissenters from Islam, because people love to have us as victims. You know, stay a victim, we can feel sorry for you. But if you speak out, then you're being too, you're just provoking, you're offending, yeah. you know, you're going too far. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but they don't understand that actually every battle that's been fought is by people going too far. And, and that's what we intend to do. We are going to go so far until we get our rights, you know. And it's not yeah. just for us. It's for everyone, you know, because when you have weaker members in society who are um, shit on, shot on, you know, every day, um, it affects everybody's rights, you know. And, and we do see that, you know. They always come for women first because it's, we're always easier targets, but then they come for everybody else. There's that amazing saying from during the Holocaust, right? They came for this person, they came yeah. for that person, and then they came for me and there was no one left. You know, and I think that is true, and we're seeing that increasingly in all of our society. Why do you think that's increasing now? Um, is there a sort of regression in society that makes these people come to power? How do you see that? Well, I mean, I think uh, with the rise of uh, the Islamic right, it has opened the space for other religious right movements. So we see the Hindu right in India, for example, uh, where you know it's now become okay to kill Muslims for eating beef. Uh, you see the rise of the Buddhist right. Everybody talks about how lovely Buddhists are, but you, you know they are massacring people in in uh, Myanmar, uh, Muslims in Myanmar, and uh, um, we see the Jewish right, of course, in the Palestinian territories, and the Christian right. I think most people here are m most familiar with. Yeah. So we we see the effects of this, and I think they. It's interesting because they seem like enemies, but they're always helping each other. You know, if you in any situation, if you go in the UN and they want to uh, file a resolution against blasphemy, all the clerics are standing together. They always are. And it's interesting because they always pretend that they're enemies, but they're the best of friends, actually. Uh, you know, if you, uh, you know the case in... Um I'm sorry, I've got my backs to you guys. <laughs> my lovely people. Um, you know, if you... The case in... Um of uh, in in uh, Britain now there's this huge thing where there are islamists who are uh, fighting against uh, the No Outsiders program in, in primary schools, which is what, basically... What is that program? So it's basically uh, books which say, you know, children's books which say, I've got two mummies or I've got two daddies. You know, it's not, you know, they make it sound like they, they're teaching kids how to have homosexual sex, you know, the way they make it sound. But that's all it is. It's, it's very age appropriate. So they've got the Islamists there, uh, protesting, but they've also got the Christian right there. You know, the far right uh, candidates like Katie Hopkins, people who hate immigrants, they've gone there and they're shaking hands with them because they all have this reactionary agenda. And I think one of the things we're seeing is when you make space for the Islamist right, you make space for all of them because they move forward together. They use each other as stepping stones and they have a very similar agenda. So it opens up space in the same way that if we find uh, in Rojava, for example, Syrian Kurdistan, where it, it is now a center of women's feminism, of secularism, in a war zone. You know, it is the center of feminism and secularism in the world. Well, when that space opens up, uh, it opens up the space for all secularists and feminists everywhere. And likewise, the religious right are also gaining from each other. And I think what doesn't help is that good people, progressive people, who are concerned about racism, and thankfully so, you know, that means we've gone to a place where it is important uh, that we are seen to be opposed to racism. At the same time, they're silent on the Islamic right because they see Islam as a minority religion. They don't recognize its fa fascistic tendencies and uh, as part of the far right, you know. Yeah. And so they are siding with the Islamists as opposed to siding with dissenters. And I think that has also opened more of a space. Yeah, and that is, of course, uh, the thing um, with Islamophobia um, that uh, I think that 
some people are afraid that when you speak out against Islamism, mm. then you're feeding into the to the far right uh, to their uh, agenda. Yeah. Um, but how you, do you make sure that you don't do that, but do speak out the way you want? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is I that something you're afraid of, for instance? I'm not afraid because I'm, I think we, we have to say what we think is right. We have a responsibility, no matter what accusations are thrown at us. But it, uh, uh, having said that, I think, you know, if you are a universalist, if you're a feminist, if you're a secularist, you're concerned about the rights of everyone, whether they're believers or not. And so you don't want to be contributing to the rise of racism, obviously. So I think from my perspective, it's about fighting many fronts at the same time. You know, if someone is a women's rights campaigner, they don't only care about women, they also care about children's rights, they care about gay rights. I mean, that's what human rights means, you know, and in the same way, if you care about the rights of apostates and blasphemers, you also have to be concerned about the rights of believers because they're linked. The freedom of conscience is something that belongs to believers and non-believers. Uh, and also, you know, we understand racism more than most because we come from Muslim backgrounds. Many of us are migrants, refugees ourselves. And so you don't want to be exacerbating. But, you know, the thing I say is, look, you've got to speak out against the religious right, no matter what, and you've got to speak out against religion, I think, because it's so key in the situation that we're faced with. But at the same time, defending people unequivocally, defending their human rights, and fighting for our common humanity. I think the thing that what the relig religion and the religious right do is really divide us, you know? And I think one thing that we can do is to unite people based on this common humanity, which is forgotten, really, because we live in a world now where everyone is divided into communities and groups. Groups are homogenized. You don't see dissent anymore within those groups. It's either silence from within or outsiders will call you, you know, feeding into the far right. Yeah. But the question is, we have a right to fight for uh, our rights within our so-called communities as well. And I think, you know, the, another example I always give is um, the Iranian government, for example, is, says it's anti-U.S. militarism. Uh, but I'm also anti-U.S. militarism. And just because I say I'm anti-U.S. militarism doesn't make me an ally of the Iranian regime. Or when George W. Bush says he wants he's started the war in Iraq because he wants to uh, defend women's rights. That doesn't mean that my saying I'm a defender of women's rights makes me one and the same with him. So I think we're, exactly. we're, we're not stupid. We, we are complex individuals. We have brains. I don't understand why you can use those brains when it comes to criticizing the Christian right and not consider that an assault and attack on Christian people. Uh, and you can even see that there are some Christians who might agree with you. Why do you not see that when it comes to Muslims? I mean, there is that sort of, it's such a um, bigoted view of Muslims. You know, one that they can't take dissent. You know, my dad's going to cut my throat the minute he gets my hands, his hands on me. Of course he's not. He's one of my biggest supporters. He does say my grandfather's turning in his grave. I've told him that's not possible, but he's, you know, <laughs> he's just, you know, he's sure of it. Uh, and of course, we don't agree on a lot of things, but, you know, people you are can get capable yeah. of, you know, even, you know, any book burning against Salman Rushdie. Well, the majority of people who come from Muslim backgrounds didn't burn the books. But you know, somehow the book burners represent everyone in that community. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then if you, you stand up and say... I, I'm not part of it. Because that community is so homogenized, it's, it looks like you're you know, oh, uh, promoting a neo-colonialist agenda. That's what we've been called. Or we're like you know, uh, Uncle Tom's and native informants and coconuts and all of that. And that is because uh, people think that you want to push on like, uh, human rights on other people or yeah 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 I mean I, it's interesting because why are human rights only for white people I didn't get I didn't get that memo you know <laughs> like uh, you can have gay rights you can have sex outside of marriage you can uh, walk around with uh, lollipops like that uh, you know you can uh, hold hands with your loved one in the street you can uh, uh, 
uh, have gay marriages. Oh, everything's okay for you people because y'all are so enlightened. But us, you know, barbaric, savage minorities, we can only live within the confines of Islam because we can't handle uh, freedom. You know, that's we always hear that you can't handle, you can't handle the freedom. And I, I and yeah, of course, there are reactionary uh, brown people just as there are reactionary white people, and there's lots of progressive brown people just as there are lots of progressive white people. And I think. If rights are universal, then they are universal. They belong to everyone. Yeah. Uh, and you know, th the reality is that rights are not something that any Western government gave or any um, power uh, gave. It's something that you know people fought for tooth and nail. The women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement in the United States. You know, they're still fighting uh, against racism today. Um, but the, the anti-apartheid movement, the anti-colonial movement, people fought tooth and nail. They lost their lives for those fights. So that fight is my fight. It belongs to me. The rights that have been gained belongs to all of us. Uh, and I think dividing this Western Eastern is just a way of denying a large numbers of people their rights. I mean, one of the things I will say is the Iranian government wants nuclear technology. They never say that's Western. We don't want it. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. We want to carry on riding our camels. The car was made, I don't know, somewhere in the West. They never say that. No. But when it comes to women's rights, human rights, you know, the rights of apostates and blasphemers, that's Western, that's neocolonialism. Neocolonialism, yeah. and you've got lots of good liberal people in this country, in Europe, saying the exact same thing, which one really makes one really frustrated. I mean, I think what frustrates me more is not the hate I get from the far right. Um, to be honest, bring it on, because the more you hate me, the more I know I'm doing something right. But what really is painful, I mean painful, is when you've got people who should be on your side, you know? people who should be standing with you, who are stabbing you in the back. You know, and I've got so many examples of that, you know, where uh, they've sided with the Islamic society, they've sided with the Islamists, people who want to murder me, they've sided with them and they won't side with us. And that, I think, is so painful because, you know, it's the, the whole idea of human solidarity, you know, that's what keeps us alive, knowing that there are people who stand with us and that we will win. But sometimes we feel like we're the only ones fighting and we're very, very lonely, I think. But the, the great thing is now there's so many of us, right? They can't ignore us. And that's what's made the difference. And, and I think largely that's thanks to social media and the internet. We could not have been where we are today. I think people would still not know who we are. Uh, if it wasn't for the internet, because we have reached out to each other, we found each other, we've got strength from each other, and we're fighting back in a way that is, I think, scaring uh, a lot of Islamic states, truly scaring them. And you can tell from the way they perceive us, you know, Saudi Arabia calls atheist terrorists, the Egyptian government set up a ministry to uh, eliminate atheism amongst the youth, the Iranian government paper writes about atheism as a tsunami in Iran that they need to control. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you can see that they're afraid uh, because they know what we represent, not just to the religious right movement, but to religion itself. Uh, because by being able to question it, to challenge it, uh, you know, it does uh, destroy things uh, and it for opens them. Up yeah. oh, and opens up the space for, for free thinkers everywhere. Yeah, and of course, you, you just mentioned uh, Iran and that it's, it's not uh, really going very well there, but you also have the protests of the women with the veils. Um, yeah. Do you see that as a progressive movement? Is that something um, that's going in the right direction or do you think it doesn't have any power? Oh my gosh, I think it's hugely important, you know. And it's interesting because you know how many years we had to listen to people saying the veil is the source of liberation, it's empowering... <laughs> Uh, we, you know, the veil is uh, uh, for part, part of feminism, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, when you don't, when people don't see the resistance, it becomes easy to say a lot of bullshit, you know, because uh, you can't see it. And also the resistance is hidden because no one wants to focus on it because it's troublesome. It's provocative, they think. But when, you know, so many do it, like the ex-Muslim movement, like the unveiling movement in Iran, that gets the attention of the world, you know? It just shows the very point that, look, a lot of those women who are now facing 20, 24 uh, 
and more years imprisonment merely for taking off the veil and walking down a public street. You know, people will see that one, it's not their culture, it's not their religion. If it was their culture and religion, why all this compulsion? Why all this force? Why do you need the morality police and the Basiji and the revolutionary guards and the full force of the state and the law, Sharia law, to compel women to wear the veil? It's obviously not their culture. It's obviously not what they want. This is a compulsion. And this is the case for many things, uh, from Sharia law to um, even the fact that Everybody says they're Muslims when, in fact, there are so many ex-Muslims, non-believers amongst them, you know. So I think these, these fights are linked. You know, uh, the fight f against compulsory veiling is a, a fight against religious rule uh, and its attempts to control and manage women's bodies and sexuality. And I think the fight for apostasy and blasphemy rights is a fight uh, against religion's attempts to control our minds and to control dissent and doubt. So I think, you know, they work together as the women's movement against veiling progresses, so do we, and vice versa. And do you think there's a difference between um, women who have to wear the veil compulsory, compulsory in, uh, in Islamic law mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. and um, for instance here in the Netherlands where mm -hmm. uh, there is no such law, but mm -hmm. we always think that women wear them voluntarily? I mean, I think, I'm sure there are women who uh, wear the veil voluntarily, of course, in the same way that uh, there are women who voluntarily stay in violent relationships. And I'm sorry to make that comparison, but I do think, uh, while I have complete, I think women, wear, adult women wearing the veil have a right to wear it. I think there's so much pressure involved. Uh, there's so much uh, shunning and shaming and slut shaming if you're not properly veiled. Uh, and all of that pressure, that it's hard to know if women really choose to wear the veil. I think if you remove that shame and compulsion and the ostracism uh, from it, I think a lot less women would be voluntarily veiled. Um, but I think that nonetheless, I think we, we should be allowed to challenge it while defending women's rights. Yeah. Uh, because you don't want to be um, adding to a climate where women who are veiled have their veils pulled off their heads. Of course not, you know. But I think... Uh, we should be able to criticize the veil. And we have to, because it is like a chastity belt. It is like foot binding. It is like sati, where women were supposed to throw their, their selves on the burning pyres of their husbands. It is a way of managing and controlling women. And I know I've read studies in India that say sati is women's choice. Well, maybe a woman chose to throw herself on a burning pyre, but take away all that pressure on her. And will she do it? And why does she need to do that? You know, so I think these are questions we need to uh, ask ourselves. We need to be able to talk about an environment that's free from hate, uh, but also uh, that so a veiled woman can take part in this conversation without feeling threatened, uh, but at the same time that we can have a frank discussion. Child veiling, I think, is a form of child abuse, full stop, as is any religious symbols on children, because children are vulnerable, they shouldn't have impositions imposed by their parents. And I think the state is duty-bound to protect them. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so the, the difference between state and religion is actually important for that too. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think that, uh, for yeah. instance, in Britain, there is, that, that that's a secular country, that, it's, um, mm -hmm. that there's no religion in the state? Or are you also afraid of that coming into, mm -hmm. seeping into the... Well, I think Britain is definitely uh, not a, a secular state in any uh, sense because it's uh, the Church of England, for example, is the uh, yeah. official church of the country and uh, there are bishops in the House of Lords. It's like we have mullahs in Iran in the parliament. They have bishops. It's, it's exactly the same. And they're all as reactionary as each other. Um, and you've got, you know, prayers in parliament. Can you imagine? I would not believe that if I didn't live in Britain. Prayers in Parliament, prayers in schools. Uh, of course, a lot of people don't do it. And I think the great thing about Britain is that it is a very secularized society. And so um, it's actually a very non-religious society. Uh, but the state has that capacity, yeah. you know. And yeah. I think that's where the danger comes. Because when the state has that capacity, it can uh, impose it when 
the time is right. And so it's important to fight for secular societies. I think secularism is not the end all of everything, but I do think it's a minimum precondition. If you want women's rights, if you want gay rights, if you want the rights of apostates and blasphemers. And so I think that's a fight that we all have to be very um, involved in. You know, it's, it's definitely not a Western demand no. because now we've got Rojava, uh, which is really, uh, oh my gosh, it should be, you know, we should be having Rojava all over our bodies every day because it is such an amazing place, you know. They've banned polygamy, they've banned child marriage, they've banned Sharia courts, they've banned compulsory veiling. They have, it's a council-run society where there are women and men in every neighborhood, in every workplace. They have to have a woman and man making decisions. Wow. And apart from that, they have a separate women's council just to make sure that women's rights are respected. And it is really, a, imagine in uh, Syria, in a war zone, they've done this. So if they can do that here, I think we can do that in Britain and uh, <laughs> the Netherlands, don't you think? So I think, you know, we, we can see that definitely this is not Western. It's just nope. a universal demand, a human demand. You want to live free. Yeah. You want to, maybe you want to, uh, you want to be a believer, but you don't necessarily want to be a believer the way Al-Qaeda or the Iranian regime or the Saudi regime tells you to be a believer. It has and to be an individual choice. It's an choice. individual choice. And I think one of the problems with religion in the state is it takes away individual choice um, and it doesn't allow people. And that's why actually theocracies are very bad places also for the religious. It's not just for the, you know, the non-religious. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Leslie, I want to ask you, um, because Celebrating Descent is starting, it's starting already, yeah. um, and I was just wondering, if the, is there some program that you are especially looking forward to, or that everyone here should definitely come to see? Well, and I know I it's hard to choose. Well, I mean, if everybody's not here at every session, <laughs> I'm taking your names <laughs> and you're, I'm looking at each of you, yeah? I think, to be honest, I think uh, this weekend, thanks to Debali, thanks to you, Sophie, and Iante, I don't know if she's here, and of course, Yuri, I think uh, it's the first time where we have brought everyone together in a space that we can be seen, because usually everybody ignores us, and no matter how many of us come together, no one sees it, you know, because there is this attempt to silence and censor us. So it's very overwhelming for me. I feel very, very emotional, and I think really every, there's not one speaker who's just eh, that's, I wish there was, you know, so I could tell you, don't go to that. So but you could take a break once. So could, but I'm going to be in every single session because I think this is an opportunity of a lifetime to meet some of the most amazing people on the face of this earth. And seriously, people who have put their necks on the line, uh, people who have stood up in the most difficult circumstances and who just bloody refuse to back down, you know. And I think it, it, it is an honor to have them amongst us. And I think we really should take this time to get to know each and every one of them. Because their, um, their refusal to stand down, their dissent is opening up the space for each and every one of us. And I think, unfortunately, we don't recognize it yet. And a lot of... Uh, uh, dissenters are considered troublesome until things change and then they become heroes. So I think a lot of people here are actually tomorrow's heroes. So I hope that you will attend every single one of them. And if not, come and see me. I have something to say to you. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for being at this first interview. Um, of course, uh, you all know that um, Zineb El Razoui should be our next guest um, at 5.30. Unfortunately, uh, she's not here, uh, but we will uh, pay some more attention to that at fi uh, 5.30. So if you come back here, um, we will say something about that. So thank you very much for now.